Well, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Simon Wolf, and I have the tremendous pleasure of moderating today's webinar. Uh, I am the founder and CEO of Marlowe Strategy, an international advocacy and campaigns firm based in London. We have the pleasure of co-hosting this event with the German-Ukrainian Chamber of Industry and Commerce, as well as 2050, Europe's leading business and human rights consultancy. We have an incredible panel, which we'll come to later. In the meantime, I would like to acknowledge the many dignitaries on this call, including esteemed ministers, ambassadors, and representatives of critical trade associations. Now, a special thank you to Svetlana Mikhailovska, the EBA Deputy Director of, of, of Advocacy, um, who has agreed to make some opening comments to this webinar. By way of background, Germany has now adopted the 2021 Act on Due Diligence in Supply Chains, the DDS, the DDSC, which will have a tremendous impact on global supply chains that touch the German economy. Businesses must adapt to meet this opportunity and avoid the pitfalls and challenges of failing to comply. The DDSC is intended to promote fairness and enhance corporate social responsibility practices by improving human rights and environmental standards in global supply chains. This law will also place significant responsibility on companies falling within its scope, requiring the implementation of rigorous due diligence and risk management mechanisms. Some of the questions the panelists will address today how does the law affect suppliers outside of Germany? What could this law mean for Ukrainian companies that are or wish to become primary or secondary suppliers to Germany? What needs to be done before 2023? So without further ado, I would like to, to welcome uh, Svetlana Mikhailovska to make her opening remarks. Thank you so much. Uh, colleagues, thank you very much and uh, good morning. Uh, I'd like to thank German Ukraine Trader Chamber uh, of Commerce and uh, 2050 and Merlo Strategy for hosting this event and for having EBA and the EBA members here today. Uh, we in EBA work to make Ukraine a better place to do business and we unite around uh, 1000 member companies. And that's a great honor to share some business insights today, especially in view of uh, the new legislation to be applied. Uh, we see changes in doing business in Ukraine take place and we have digitalization, public uh, in public services, currency regulation, uh, deliberalization, the opening of the land market and urban planning reform, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the export of doing business, uh, uh, we see changes in doing business take place. And uh, the export grows every year. Uh, last year, the volume of export uh, made up uh, in US dollars over 68 billion, uh, which is the highest since uh, 2012. Mm -hmm. And the most significant result is demonstrated in the trade with products of uh, metallurgy and agricultural sector. Sure, there are some barriers to development of the business climate and uh, they remain unchanged, unfortunately. Uh, the weak judicial system, high level of corruption and significant part of shadow economy, but business really hopes that situation will, ch will change in the nearest future and uh, the more incentives we will have in terms of international mm -hmm. trade, the better would be for Ukrainian business and for European business as well. Uh, of course, we have also certain uh, geopolitical tension and energy crisis, uh, but still uh, business looks uh, for future to the future uh, with uh, certain positive perspectives. Speaking about the uh, trade between Ukraine and German, we see that Germany is one of our main trade partners, and we in EBA uh, welcome such cooperation. In the association, we have around uh, 56 German companies from different industry, uh, industries, recycling, uh, healthcare, construction, agriculture, heavy industry, electronics, transport, logistics, FMCG, etc. And we know about the changes in, ecolo uh, in ecological policy mm -hmm. in Germany. Uh, at the same time, we can't stay away from the new environmental approach to global economic relations. And it means that business as usual doesn't work anymore. More sustainability and more responsible businesses are um, keen to uh, survive in new realities. Um, 
for example, according to our calculations, since 2026, Ukrainian producers of electricity, metals, cement, fertilizers could annually lose uh, up to 1 billion euros due to uh, imposition of the uh, carbon border adjustment mechanism, CBAM. Uh, of course, there are many other risks that companies should be aware of in advance. And that's why I indeed very thankful for organizers and hosters uh, for having this event today, because new regulations in due, dil in, um, due diligence in supply chain will impact um, uh, both sides. But of course, Ukrainian, we uh, are more about the, the companies working here in Ukraine. And there are not only Ukrainian companies, but also European companies doing business here in Ukraine. However, what we see in the EBA businesses need to unite to cope with these uh, risks and new realities. Uh, we have different types of committees within the EBA, uh, uniting member companies uh, engaged in different businesses. Mm -hmm. Uh, to collaborate and to elaborate the common positions. But to make a long story short, I believe that insights and inputs that uh, we will be revealed during this webinar will help uh, our participants to plan their uh, future uh, operational activity and transform new challenges into uh, new opportunities of their growth. Thank you. Thank you so much, Svetlana. I, I, I liked your phrase, we are not in business as usual. And I think that's a, a theme we'll take throughout this presentation. Um, our next speaker is Alexander Marcus, who's the chairman of the board of the German-Ukrainian Chamber of Industry and Commerce and has been since October 2016. The chamber is part of the worldwide AHK networks and thus a reliable partner for Ukrainian and German companies for more than 25 years. Alexander, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you very much. Um, good day to everyone. Uh, we are uh, here at the Chamber since 2016 in Ukraine and as a delegation, delegation of Ukraine, German uh, business and industry are working in this country since 1993. Um, and um, we have today around about 170 members and um, our estimation is that uh, those members of the German companies, not our members being honest, but German companies, companies with German capital have um, set up, created around about 50,000 workplaces here in Ukraine, only in automotive supplying business, it's around about 30,000. So um, we have, I just came back from Lyft, we had our HK Directors Club, and uh, we uh, gathered the companies from the supplying sector. It is uh, one of the most successful business models, actually. Um, German companies are coming into the country. They are either looking for Ukrainian partners or they are doing it on their own, producing components um, in the automotive sector or electronics sphere, and then exporting to uh, all around the world, European Union, Germany, Wolfsburg, Stuttgart, Munich, wherever German cars, for example, are assembled. And uh, uh, yes, for these companies, uh, the law that will come into force next year um, is very important. And uh, um, that is why I thank you very much to my colleagues for organizing this webinar. Um, we made a pitch uh, in summer this year on our own, but it's very good to have this also repeated and repeated and repeated and repeated again, because uh, this is a very important topic. Um, we are waiting actually for um, uh, an additional law from the European Union. Um, most likely this will come in 2024 in force. Um, discussions awaited during this year. Um, and we heard rumors that it will be even more, um, how to say, uh, yeah, tougher for business than 
that one that already came will come into force next year for uh, for Germany. So far from me, and thank you very much for the colleagues to organize that. Thank you very much, Alexander. Um, we'll, I'll move straight on to our next speaker, um, Dr. Frank Schauf. Um, Frank has more than 20 years of experience in strategic communications and public affairs on the German, EU and international level. Um, Frank has worked in Germany's and the EU's top foreign policy environments, including the leadership of the SPD in Berlin. In more than 12 years as CEO of the Association of Euro European Businesses, the main representative body of foreign investors in Russia, Frank has gathered extensive high-level Eurasian economic and political expertise. Frank, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I send you best wishes from Berlin. Uh, and if you allow me, I would uh, like to, to give you a uh, short uh, overlook of the Berlin perspective with regards uh, to the new legislation, the German Supply Chain Act, uh, which is the main topic of our uh, discussion this morning. Um, you have to understand, if you talk about the genesis, that there was a long-term discussion internationally in Germany on social and environmental uh, standards in the number of industries and countries uh, who are, let's say, supplying industries and specifically German industry um, in, uh, let's say, to, to, to broad extents, because certainly Germany is depending very much on supply from outside uh, the country. Especially uh, those who were involved in development cooperation uh, criticized the situation in uh, some of the uh, industries and countries. Uh, for example, with regards to child labor, uh, we can here name the, 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 the examples of mining in some African uh, countries or textile industry in Bangladesh, which were um, popular examples for this discussion. And uh, as I certainly since the discussion did not only uh, happen in, in Germany, but also in a number of companies. In 2011, the Human Rights Committee of the UN adopted a resolution on human rights on transnational cooperation and other business enterprises. And uh, from this, uh, there was, let's say, the, the, the foundation of, uh, came the foundation of the German Global Compact Network, as in other countries as well, in order to implement social rights, uh, let's say, in uh, international uh, supply chains. In the end, um, as we saw then last decade, the evaluation of this uh, has been rather negative because uh, at least for German companies, it was the fact that uh, they would not uh, comply necessarily with the pledges that had been made uh, by business associations, uh, etc. And uh, therefore the result was that during the last decade in uh, the political structures here in Berlin, uh, there was a discussion to have uh, a law uh, on this issue in, uh, in the future. And in fact, uh, when uh, a new coalition was uh, created between Christian and Social Democrats in 2017, uh, this law was then uh, let's say agreed in the coalition agreement. Um, and um, let's say in spite of the, the, the resistance of business associations and also the criticism, surprisingly, of trade unions, uh, this legislation has been uh, adopted in summer last year, as has been said, and it will come into force uh, for German companies on the 1st of January uh, 23. Um, and uh, what is important to understand is that from the 1st of January 23, it will uh, be relevant for companies um, of um, up to uh, 1, 3,000 employees, and uh, then uh, from, 21st, uh, from the 1st of January 2024, uh, it's uh, relevant also for companies uh, with 1,000 employees. So the, the, the number of companies uh, will broaden uh, significantly in, in the year after. The philosophy of, of this law is uh, a comprehensive one. And also uh, I had the chance to talk with uh, um, politicians here in, in Berlin, uh, also recently with regards to the implementation of this law, they understand certainly that it has uh, an, an overall effect, a universal effect uh, beyond the German borders, because what will come up now is um, that German companies will have um, to go through their supply chain in detail and uh, report to the German government. Uh, Valeria will later uh, go into details with uh, regards to the functioning of that law. 
um, but certainly uh, let's say the, the, the effect on German companies uh, themselves is rather limited because they have certainly to uh, have somebody responsible in the company for the reporting and the scrutiny, the monitoring, uh, and they will have to report also to the German uh, legislator. But in the end, um, in, in, in a number of cases, the, uh, the immediate and also the intermediate effect uh, for foreign companies supplying German ones uh, might be much wider. Um, I discussed it with one, with one um, politician uh, who is a deputy minister of uh, labor and social affairs here in Germany. Um, and he would give the example, uh, let's say, of, of an African uh, company who would use uh, child labor, which certainly is illegal uh, under German conditions, but also internationally speaking. Um, and then the German company under this act would be forced um, to uh, finish, to terminate the, the relationship with that given company and find a supplier who wouldn't use uh, child labor. Uh, and this would lead certainly in the long run um, to a higher competitiveness for those who would comply uh, with that, these standards, uh, which in the end are international standards, which are listed uh, in the German legislation. Um, about perspectives, um, I would like to say that uh, we are waiting now for the administrative regulations uh, in order to understand what uh, is going to be the, the technical uh, way of functioning of that legislation. <clears throat> and this certainly is something which we most probably should um, inform you about also in the future. We're expecting this in the next uh, few weeks and months. And another thing Alexander Marcos has already mentioned it is that um, there's also discussion on a new legislation uh, similar to the German one. Um, there is already two existing legislations in France and the Netherlands, uh, which seems to be less strict than, than the German one. And now we, we know that uh, after uh, two or three uh, attempts already before, uh, mid-February, there will be a new uh, bill submitted to the uh, Commissioner's Act of the uh, Commissioner's College of the European Union. And then, uh, as Alexander Marcos said, out, we don't know yet uh, when in fact it will happen, but we assume that towards the middle of this decade, we will have um, a legislation uh, which is then uh, going to be comprehensive for the, for the whole European Union. So this is what I want to say, let's say, perhaps as a broader picture with regards uh, to the Berlin perspective on this uh, legislation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Frank. Um, our next speaker um, is Valeria Schuller, and she's a senior consultant in the Berlin practice of 2050. As I said before, Europe's leading business and human rights consultancy. Valeria has extensive experience advising 2050's German clients on the implementation of human rights due diligence including the requirements of this new Supply Chain Act. Her work draws on her international portfolio and her Ukrainian-Russian roots. Valeria, it's a pleasure to have you. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this uh, kind of introduction. Could you please confirm that you can see my slides? Yes, indeed. Yes, okay, great. Let's get started. Thank you very much for um, yes, hosting this really timely webinar. And I have the great pleasure to now take you into uh, some of the details of this new legislation that we see in Germany. And before um, I start, I'd like to give you a brief impression on what we'll be speaking in, about in the next 17 minutes or so. So I'll start with a brief introduction about 2050 and the work that we do. Um, and then we'll go into the details of the act. We'll look at why the um, Supply Chain Act has been passed in Germany specifically. We will um, go into the question of who's covered by the act. And then of course, uh, into the expectations, what is expected uh, from companies going forward in Germany, but also beyond. Um, and then we will um, also speak about um, some of the um, ways in which the German government will ensure that compliance um, actually uh, takes place um, because the law also prescribes a few penalties for companies that do not meet the, the new requirements. And I will finish with a first overview of some of the implications that this new act may have for Ukrainian businesses 
um, that supply the German market. And I, I am aware we will have uh, other speakers following my presentation who will go into further depth on the question of the implications for Ukrainian businesses. So let's dive right in. Um, I would like to start with just a few words about 2015, our work, to give you the context of uh, why I am qualified to, uh, to speak about, about this new act uh, to you today. So 2050 is uh, one of Europeans leading management consultancies for human rights in business. That means we have over 17 years of experience working with mostly multinational companies that operate all across the world and supporting them in understanding both their human rights impacts and risks, but also in helping them to take action once they have identified uh, their human rights risks. So we really help companies along the whole human rights journey from the very first steps of understanding which areas they need to um, uh, which human rights areas they need to understand better, understanding their specific human rights um, risk profile, but also taking them for the long in setting up comprehensive risk management systems, addressing issues that come up, uh, so uh, reacting to, uh, to concrete negative impacts, setting up um, processes like grievance mechanisms, and also, of course, uh, human rights reporting. What we do as well is um, we invest a lot of our time in building capability across uh, businesses and so that every function that is um, uh, charged with um, implementing human rights due diligence in their everyday operations can understand what that actually means. Because as for you, it's very common that uh, the area of human rights due diligence may seem a bit abstract at the start. So our business is really about translating these abstract requirements into the reality of business. And as you can see, we have worked with a large amount of multinational enterprises on this journey. We have supported them at the whole spectrum from the headquarters uh, up to their uh, local operations and emerging markets. And as it comes to Germany, we've uh, had uh, quite a, um, a long-standing practice in Germany for about 10 years. And in that time, we, were, we had the great privilege of working with up to a third of the DAX 30 companies. So that should be enough to provide you some context of where our expertise comes from uh, when, it, when we now look at the, German, the new German Supply Chain Act. As we go into that um, um, question, why did this German Supply Chain Act was passed at that particular time? I would like to zoom out a little bit to, uh, to really show you that this act really doesn't come as a surprise and was not passed in a vacuum, but actually is um, a reflection of quite a great momentum of regulating corporate human rights due diligence. So what we see is that in 2011, the, the UN Human Rights Council passed uh, the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. And these principles were the, uh, the, the most comprehensive framework um, that had ever been issued uh, codifying the responsibilities that states have and companies have in pro uh, protecting human rights. And what these principles did for the first time in, in, in history is they acknowledged the great importance that companies have in uh, providing an enabling environment for human rights protection. They said companies have so much political and economical power that actually human rights cannot be protected without their participation. And so they detailed what these responsibilities could look like for companies, for companies that want to step up and, and be responsible um, around their social impact, around the impact that they have on people. And I'm speaking about these principles because they're quite an important milestone that influences everything that has happened ever since, including this new act. So since 2011, we have seen an increasing number of countries actually implementing these guiding principles into national standards. But so for, for, for the first part, uh, for the first years, countries were following a voluntary approach. They were adopting voluntary non-binding principles and so did the German government in 2016 uh, with the national action plan uh, on business and human rights which was uh, directly an impl like implementing and translating the principles into the German context because the German government didn't want to regulate and didn't want to pass mandatory regulation at first 
Um, but they, uh, so they tried the national action plan as a voluntary standard and then conducted a great monitoring exercise to check if German companies are actually compliant with these uh, voluntary standards. And they found out that that is actually not the case, that not enough German companies are stepping up to implement voluntary requirements into their operations. And so this is the backdrop against which the new act has been passed as a reaction to the realization that voluntary standards are not enough. And so this new law is a direct continuation of the UN guiding principles. It follows uh, the, the, the ideas that has, have been anchored there, but it now says we do stand behind mandatory regulation. We need to regulate. And the German government is not enough for that step forward towards mandatory regulation, because as Frank has said, uh, we see actually a wide, uh, like all across Europe and, and beyond, an increase of mandatory regulation that says companies have to understand their human rights impacts and they have to manage them. And we are indeed expecting an EU-wide regulation that will further confirm this, this point uh, for the EU market in this year. So let's look at the German law specifically and who is covered by the law. As Frank said earlier as well, um, that the, 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 law, um, the scope of the law uh, first and foremost includes German companies and foreign companies with branches in Germany of a certain size. This means that by 2023, first companies with over 3,000 employees will have to implement the act. And then starting in 2024, the threshold will sink and it will affect companies with over 1,000 employees. Now, when you look at these numbers, they may evoke the illusion that actually this law is only relevant for German companies or foreign companies that have a subsidiary or a branch in Germany. But um, it is in fact an illusion because the law says that companies that fall within the scope of the law have to understand the human rights impacts and risks in their own operations and across all of their supply chains. Now, what is meant by supply chain? The act means when it speaks about supply chain that um, companies have to understand the human rights impacts that are connected to all products and services of an enterprise. That includes the actions of the company in its own operations and business areas, but also the actions of direct suppliers and indirect suppliers. And that includes activities like transport, but also storage of goods. So more kind of um, um, surrounding activities uh, that enable the core business to take place. And this, this is really the, uh, the, the key message uh, for the audience today, that by this provision, by including the whole supply chain, this is how the act becomes, um, gets an impact beyond German borders, because what will happen is that German companies will have to look deeply into their own supply chains. They will have to engage deeply with their suppliers in all markets to understand how these suppliers are managing the known human rights risks and impacts in their operations. And I want to close this point by saying that this law was specifically designed to have this influence beyond the German market, to raise global human rights standards through the supply chains that lead into the German market. Now, what is expected concretely by the law? The law prescribes that it expects companies uh, exercise due regard for human rights and environment related due diligence. Um, and they conduct um, due diligence uh, in their supply chains. You may wonder what due diligence means in this regard. And I've tried to uh, summarize it uh, simply on the slide. In fact, due diligence, like in, in other areas of business, in this, uh, in this uh, case also means to implement an ongoing risk management process, which will help to identify, prevent, and mitigate, mitigate negative human rights impacts. And as you know from other areas in your business, due diligence usually implies a process to assess risks, a process to take actions on risks that have been identified, a process to track progress, and a process to communicate about that progress. 
Now, I know that companies are actually familiar with risk management and due diligence processes from other areas, but typically they implement them for financial or reputational risks. But in principle, the process here is quite similar to these known and familiar due diligence processes. The only difference is that the, 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 the point of focus needs to shift from risk to business to risk to people. And that's quite a big shift to businesses because businesses have been designed historically to look at the risk for business, financial risk, reputational risk. And now this law, as well as all other laws that are a continuation of the UN guiding principles, they demand a shift in perspective, an additional perspective that will include people that are impacted by the company's operations. Now let, let's look a little deeper into what the law says um, about human rights and environment, because the expectation is that companies implement due diligence processes that will monitor and address human rights and environmental related risks. Human rights tends to be an abstract concept, so it's good to break it down. And here you see a list that is also included in the law of typical uh, human rights risks that companies will have to monitor and um, address going forward. Now, I have to say that the human rights risk profile will really differ depending on the size of the company, the type of the company, the sector in which it operates, and the market in which it operates. Uh, therefore, this list here is just to give you an orientation, but it may not be fully applicable to your company's profile. So um, typical supply chain risks that would need to be considered are topics like child and forced labor, the freedom from discrimination, health and safety um, in operations, but also questions of adequate pay or uh, freedom of association, so the right to form a trade union or other workers' representative bodies. On the environment uh, side, because the law, even though it has a strong human rights focus, also includes a few environmental provisions, and it asks companies to consider those environmental risks which may lead to the harm in people. So, for example, poisoning through contamination of water can lead to um, an infringement of the right to health. So that would be an environmental risk that would need to be considered. But the law speaks also about environmental risks um, where um, certain substances, um, related to certain sub substances that have been banned. So it mentions international conventions that regulate the use of mercury, of organic pollutants, but also of hazardous waste. Now, if we move forward and look at the question of how the law will be, um, will be um, how the implementation of the, the will be enforced, um, I am um, pleased, well, uh, it's important to mention that the German government is, is taking the enforcement of this law actually very seriously. It is in the process of creating a new department to um, to an um, administrative uh, office that already exists. So the BAFA that you see here on the slide. And this new department of BAFA will be charged with nothing else but uh, monitoring the enforcement of this law. And it will start its annual reviews in 2023. That means that it will review and, and analyze um, and sense check the, the annual reporting that companies will have to do to demonstrate their implementation. When it comes to liability uh, for the law, the law doesn't really change the legal basis for liability for companies. That means that even now, employees that are uh, abroad can, can, use, uh, can sue German companies for damages if they feel that their human rights have been violated by the activities of the company. And the law doesn't change this uh, possibility um, what, what does change is that it creates new procedural possibilities how to pursue these legal actions. So in the future, people who feel that their human rights have been affected can, can work together with trade unions or NGOs um, to, uh, to get help uh, in litigation of these civil cases. 
The, the law also prescribes penalties. It sets um, quite hefty uh, financial penalties and administrative fines, which can reach, depending on the size of the company and the annual turnover, up to 8 million euros or 2% of the turnover. Um, Non-compliance with the act can also lead from the exclusion from awards from public contracts. Now, um, coming to the end of my presentation, I want to spend a few moments reflecting on what this all means for Ukrainian businesses that supply the German market, because we have seen the main um, the main focus is indeed on German companies and their suppliers will be um, um, impacted indirectly. So this means that Ukrainian businesses will not be risking uh, sanctions by the German government or, or administrative fines. However, they need to expect that their German clients who are under the pressure of these, uh, of these uh, uh, penalties will start um, to review their, their, contract, their contracts and code requirements for their suppliers. So Ukrainian businesses can expect um, that the, the contracts that they have with their German buyers will include human rights and environmental expectations in line with this law. So they, they may risk to lose business if they are unable to show adequate risk management in their own operations. So Ukrainian businesses re really need to get ready to know and show uh, that they understand these human rights requirements um, and to show how they are working with them. But I want to really underline that this is not only a burden for Ukrainian businesses, even though it may feel like that at the start, but in fact, it's actually an opportunity to stand apart from other suppliers. It's an opportunity to build a competitive advantage that will pay not only into the German market, but in fact, into all the other markets that are adopting similar laws and going forward, the whole European Union market. And I know I'm already over time, so let me just conclude with just uh, 30 seconds um, on, on a key message, because I know when, uh, when companies are first confronted with these um, with these expectations, they might feel quite daunting and overwhelming, and they might feel um, like out of context with the local challenges that companies are, are facing. But I really want to say that there is no need to reinvent the wheel here. But even though these requirements may feel new to the Ukrainian market, there's plenty of experience uh, in implementing human rights due diligence worldwide. Since 2011, since the passing of the UN guiding principles, Hundreds, if not thousands of companies have already embarked on this human rights journey. They have built up practices and experiences and what it means to work with human rights all across the world, including in emerging and, and more challenging environments. And so there is expertise and, um, and support available. 2050 is one of, uh, of these places where support can be provided, but there are plenty of other providers and areas and, 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 and offers, including from the German government that can help companies start on their human rights journey. So with these word, uh, words of encouragement, I'm going to close my presentation for now and pass over to Simon. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Valeria. That was absolutely fascinating. What a useful and comprehensive overview of the challenge and opportunity that we all face. Um, I saw in the uh, question section, someone had asked um, whether or not this recording would be made available um, afterwards. Um, we should be able to do that. Um, please bear with us and we can you know, contact through the, 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 the forum that we have. Um, the other point I was going to make is those very useful slides we will make available to all of the participants. Uh, we will send those out either later today or, or early tomorrow morning. Uh, Alexander, you have your, your hand up before, uh, if you'd like to make some comments before we hand over to Kirill, go ahead. Uh, actually a question because I'm not sure. Um, I was told um, that the procedure would be that NGOs or even um, yeah, natural persons um, approach the German um, BFAA, BAFA, Bundesamt für Außenwirtschaft, and um, they would actually uh, check the, yeah, the situation and maybe then 
um, announce a penalty. And the companies that uh, don't agree with it, they have go to court. So um, that is my question. What is the procedure? Do, do the NGOs go, have to go to court or um, do they have to defend themselves against penalties from German authorities? Blair, I believe that question's for you. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I believe both will be possible. Um, I think what I've, I've been saying is that even before this law, there has been the, like the, the legal possibility to pursue civil procedures against, against companies on, on, uh, when human rights are negatively impacted. But this law creates an additional opportunity to collaborate with NGOs on that behalf. And that may involve BAFA in, 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 in the leading up. But I, uh, but I believe these can be two standalone uh, processes, one going directly to court and one actually bringing forward information for BAFA to consider uh, when it reviews the, the compliance uh, with, the, with the act in its annual reviews. Thank you for that okay. cl Thanks. clarification. Mm -hmm. So to our, our next speaker, uh, and, and, and please let's welcome him, um, Kirill Emanchin. Um, he's a freelance consultant on CSR issues in business, non-financial risks and fragile and conflict affected situations. Kirill's a Swiss national, but he now resides in Ukraine. Uh, and his professional background is in multilateral diplomacy, human rights promotion, monitoring and sustainable reporting. Uh, after 15 years of an executive corporate career, Kirill has recently helped reputable international NGOs and think tanks to fine tune their engagement strategies in relation to the conflict in Eastern Ukraine. Kirill, the floor is yours and thank you so much for joining. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Simon. And uh, uh, most welcome to uh, the participants. Uh, thank you for finding time. Um, you see that I prepared a couple of, uh, not really presentation, but uh, a couple of uh, opening points. Uh, let me... Uh, I think, uh, and what uh, the, uh, from the point of view where I come from, uh, both corporate and human rights uh, backgrounds. First, I think there, there would be a question among many uh, uh, this webinar. Is it uh, only me that having problems with the sound? Or? I don't know. There is some cracking. Yeah, yeah, some cracking. So just. Uh, meanwhile, I think, uh, Matt, uh, uh, you've, uh, uh, could you kindly change uh, my talking points to, uh, uh, to the ones that I've sent earlier? Any better? Yes, much better now. Okay. Shall I proceed? Go ahead, Carol. Okay, uh, so soon you will see the uh, the uh, uh, sort of the questions which at least I was asking myself uh, when preparing uh, for this webinar. Um, some people would think, uh, why such attention to human rights? And is it really a problem uh, for Ukraine? Uh, the answer is very simple. Uh, Euro integration is the constitutional principle of Ukraine. Um, this aspiration uh, is not enough. Uh, the wish is not enough. Uh, Ukraine will need to answer, uh, and it has agreed to do so, with Copenhagen uh, criteria. And uh, it's mostly about democracy and human rights. Other actors uh, are uh, attentive uh, to these aspects. Uh, you know that the United States uh, <clears throat> accord by bipartisan political sympathy and support to Ukraine, uh, while uh, Germany uh, quite a peculiar case is setting trends in international human rights protection and monitoring. Uh, human rights specialists uh, have uh, mm, noted a uh, very recent uh, groundbreaking uh, decision by the, uh, by the German judiciary when it uh, accorded a guilty verdict to a foreign national who has committed uh, violation of human rights, mainly torture, in a third country. Uh, Ukraine is uh, considered as uh, a democracy, yet volatile and unconsolidated. 
of course, if we uh, compare it to its uh, uh, neighbors, uh, former USSR countries, uh, we will see an astonishing progress. But uh, uh, rule of law uh, deficiencies are duly noted. And of course, it's uh, understood, uh, the situation is understood as aggravated by the uh, current conflict. Uh, there are a lot of uh, materials uh, to study on an, uh, analyzing human rights situation uh, in Ukraine, be it the Human Rights Watch report or reports of the United Nations Human Rights Monitoring uh, mission in Ukraine. And it's, uh, we can be sure that uh, G7 will continue to uh, provide uh, an accord, uh, concerted, friendly pressure on Ukraine in order to improve uh, the human rights uh, uh, policy of, uh, of the state. The second question which I asked myself, uh, uh, and which maybe some participants ask themselves, uh, will it be worthwhile to uh, seek external assistance in preparing for the implementation? Um, I would say yes, because uh, for many companies, uh, they will need to strike uh, a delicate balance between the interests of different uh, actors uh, in, in different cabinets in their uh, corporate governance and corporate management structure. Uh, GR, uh, government, government relations, will be interested in uh, CSR and uh, HSE functions. Uh, PR, uh, investor relations, and of course, compliance and corporate governance. Uh, it uh, It's I think that's a safe assumption that in many countries, uh, in many companies, um, not all these uh, functions exist, but GR and PR uh, definitely uh, will be the ones to try to lead in this process with their own sometimes uh, peculiar uh, perspectives and priorities. So uh, consultants uh, uh, would be uh, very helpful in striking this delicate balance, uh, bearing in mind that they've dealt with these issues. Uh, in many, 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 many companies. Uh, the consultant's world is complicated. It's not, it's very difficult to navigate it. One of the basic criteria would be not the price, not the, uh, not the speed, but user friendliness. Frankly speaking, I think that uh, uh, 2050 uh, is a very user friendly company, uh, but I'm not here to advertise uh, uh, the success of my uh, colleagues. Last but not question is uh, uh, what is the experience right now? Uh, is this, is the soil uh, fertilized enough uh, in Ukraine? Uh, I can say that uh, the practice of uh, social reporting and uh, due diligence reporting is just 10 years old. Uh, the first uh, social non-financial report by an industrial company conducted in full uh, compliance with the uh, best practice and assessed by the by external auditors. Uh, it was the text some time ago, which followed uh, uh, 10 years ago, which followed by a report by a bank. It's interesting that uh, some of the companies uh, managed to maintain this uh, image, uh, but the second report by the bank uh, in half years time after its presentation, the owner of the business fled Ukraine and is still being searched for uh, investment. <clears throat> Uh, I would suggest that uh, uh, easy answers like sneak around uh, in Russian or Ukrainian let or wait and see approach is uh, would be counterproductive. In Russian, uh, it will lead just to loss of time, energy, and resources. My last point is uh, what would be uh, uh, in it for uh, each and every uh, manager. Uh, well, it's well understood that uh, personal reward and corporate uh, advancement of career are very valid motivators, uh, but we should also take into account the psychological uh, drivers for uh, why we uh, wake up every day and go to work. And I think it's uh, much more pleasant uh, to work sustainably for a company which enjoys a uh, well-deserved reputation uh, than meeting uh, challenges of working for a company which is considered uh, sort of a usual suspect. Uh, my final point is that uh, uh, it's, not, uh, uh, it's not too complicated. The purpose of this due diligence is just to ensure that the working environment of the product or service entail no human rights or environmental breach or violation. 
and to inform uh, the external audiences uh, accordingly, uh, truthfully and comprehensively. Thank you very much, Simon. Thank you all. Thank you, Kirill. I, I really especially love that empathetic perspective, the, the, the getting up in the morning and looking oneself in the mirror to work for a company that abides by these standards. I think that's a really, a really good point. Um, we, after some technical difficulties, we, we are now, we do have the pleasure of welcoming um, Ambassador at Large, Olga Trometseva, uh, who's in charge of uh, export and investment promotion. Uh, Olga, thank you so much for making the time this morning. Um, we open up the floor and welcome, welcome you to make a few remarks um, on this subject. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me at this webinar. Thank you for the invitation. And as we see from the participants, uh, um, number um the interest uh, from the ukrainian side from the ukrainian businesses uh, already there to the topic despite the uh, um, fact that uh, uh, this exactly this issue is really new for the ukrainian market it is was uh, as it was uh, already stated before um in general i just want to maybe uh, make uh, three uh, major points here um it's absolutely clear that uh, such issues like uh, corporate social Social responsibility, including the wider um, uh, wider sense of this responsibility for the companies, for the producers, for the uh, suppliers to the uh, German or European or American companies in Ukraine, settled in Ukraine, um, is getting more and more important um, for Ukrainian businesses in all sectors. Um, if they want to uh, be and stay uh, globally competitive, uh, that's absolutely clear. Um, and uh, uh, such uh, particular, such specific issues uh, like uh, each, uh, this one uh, which we are looking at uh, uh, today um, um, should be um, really brought uh, in detail uh, to not only to the businesses who are already working with, uh, uh, let's say, German um, companies directly, uh, but also to the businesses, uh, medium-sized businesses um, who are interested in uh, entering the uh, German markets or, or who are interested to be the part of this global uh, supply chains, uh, let's say, um, again, um, it's, uh, it's uh, non-dependent on the uh, um, Germany or other countries. Uh, one of my questions, maybe uh, after the, I, I was uh, I was listening attentively to the presentation uh, of Valeria, and one of my questions I already see uh, a couple of questions in our chat, uh, but my question is also, you know, uh, what we are getting um, in such kind of discussions with Ukrainian businesses, uh, uh, and I know already it's from my personal experience on uh, discussions, for instance, uh, on the sustainability issues um, in the agri food sector and sustainability, again, in a broader sense, in a broader understanding uh, when we're including the ecological, uh, social, um, um, all other kind of things. Uh, the Ukrainian uh, businesses are sometimes asking, well, okay, um, we are ready to work on the uh, uh, due diligence issues. Uh, we are ready to work to meet these higher standards. Um, but uh, first, the first question is, uh, is it only the uh, act uh, which is now under the in Germany uh, will it be discussed or is it discussed already at the European uh, European Union level? Um, and the second thing uh, is it also the issue for the other markets uh, like uh, North American markets, like Asian markets? Uh, maybe we're not talking uh, about China right now, definitely, but uh, um, South Korea, Japan, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, because uh, um, I will be very pragmatic here, and uh, what we see on the uh, example of the um, uh, agricultural markets, uh, uh, when you have a uh, possibility, here may be definitely the, a little bit uh, different case, but uh, um, if, you, if you have as a producer the possibility to avoid uh, such kind of the higher standards uh, uh, to export or to be involved in the uh, cooperational or supply chains with uh, such markets like Germany, um, uh, that uh, Kirill mentioned this to, to uh, 
words. I don't know if our English speaking colleagues uh, uh, understood them. Um, I mean, Marozitsa e Pitlet. So uh, this is exactly the case of uh, Propitlet. Yeah, so try to avoid such kind of requirements uh, due to, I don't know, some sort of uh, third countries uh, or to even to uh, um, redirect uh, the exports uh, uh, to the uh, third countries as well, uh, if it's possible, absolutely. Um, but um, if we're talking about the state level, um, here is my third point, uh, that we should bring it also uh, maybe more clearly uh, to the um, Ukrainian uh, state and governmental institutions. I know that Taras Kachka is uh, also, uh, if I'm not mistaken, he's with us, uh, and uh, he, um, I hope he, he tell also a couple of words uh, um, on this issue uh, from the point of view of the Ministry of Economy um, of Ukraine. Um, but uh, here is a lot of work as far as I know, as, as far as I, I uh, monitored as, uh, a little bit uh, this uh, issue, um, a, a lot of work at the governmental level, at the uh, um, formatting of the uh, legislative framework level. And uh, that's exactly, by the way, one of the issues which uh, Alexander Marcos, uh, uh, hello, Alexander, uh, touched uh, shortly, um, how exactly will it work? Uh, it should be from very beginning uh, quite clear, I mean, uh, defined uh, for businesses. Um, we should understand very clearly, uh, okay, uh, we should undertake a step one, step two, step three um, to meet these uh, standards, to meet these requirements and uh, uh, to not fall out, out, the, uh, out of the uh, supply chains and uh, co cooperative uh, chains and uh, projects uh, with German partners or European Union partners or whoever else. So I will stop here. Uh, I think that we will have a couple of hour issues uh, for discussion in our uh, Q&A uh, session. Um, once more, thank you uh, 2050 for the organiza organization of this webinar and uh, for bringing uh, this very important issue to the attention, uh, to the radar, let's say, and uh, to the agenda of the Ukrainian businesses. Thank you very much, Ambassador, um, for those wonderful comments. Um, Valeria, did you want to pick up on that question? Yes, indeed. Thank you very much, uh, Olga, for for these um, for these pointers and your question. And I, I feel they address um, actually um, really important points that will be on the minds of, of many. So you asked us, uh, you asked um, um, whether these uh, due diligence requirements are only being discussed in the EU or also in other markets like North America or Asian markets and whether or not it's worth to go through the effort or um, might it not be easier to well redirect to markets that, that, that don't have uh, such high standards. Well, as I said before, this is really a global movement. Of course, we now have like a concentration and a peak of these efforts taking place in the EU with different countries in the EU passing mandatory leg leg legislation like France in 2017. Now we have Germany, we have Switzerland, we have Holland. Uh, we have um, topic specific laws like on modern slavery in the UK. And then the EU will definitely uh, kind of uh, align and harmonize these efforts for the whole EU market. Market. So now we're already looking at uh, 25 plus countries uh, that, that will go up together. But we do indeed see uh, the same trend, uh, not at the same speed, but the same trend still happening all across the world. So the reason why I spoke quite a lot about the UN guiding principles, you may have wondered why she's spending so much time speaking about these, it's because I really want you to go away knowing this title, the UN Guiding Principles. And the reason why I want you to know them is because they are the international standard that are influencing the new laws on human rights and environmental due diligence across the globe. So for example, we have a topic specific law in California that looks on like forced labor and, and supply chains. We have modern slavery legislation in Australia. And why they, they, they pick out particular risk topics like modern slavery, they still are very much in principles uh, in the logic aligned with the UN guiding principles. So, so what does that mean for companies that are uh, ready to go and do the work? It means that what, if they want to set themselves up for success, it's really helpful to, to align with the UN guiding principles because these guiding principles in, in, inform all the different laws that are coming up. 
So, so you're really on the safe side if you understand how does human rights due diligence work from, uh, from the point of view of the UN guiding principles. And then, of course, you, your lawyers will still need to do the work and understand what are the country specific requirements. But the base, the really underlying logic of human rights due diligence has been excellently defined in the UN guiding principles. And a lot of tools, very practical, helpful, step-by-step -step tools have been developed for companies and tried and tested already on how does this work for companies of different sizes. And that speaks, I think, to this other point that you made, Olga, that companies really need both clarity and support in this implementation because it is new. And I want to reiterate the UN guiding principles were passed in 2011, and since then, companies and selected governments have been developing support, step-by-step -step guidance, and this will need to continue, but it's already there. And just to finish um, about this law and this desire for clarity, which is really understandable, but we will all need a, a bit more patience with the German government because the German government has taken a big leap doing something that is way beyond what other governments have done. And in fact, there is, I think, hundreds of administrative workers now trying to figure out and skill up to interpret this law because in many ways this has not existed in this in this way in Germany before in many of the detailed questions including you know what does it mean for upstream supply chains what does it mean when Ukrainian companies are buying from German companies how does that apply then that is one of those nuanced questions that are still being refined and answered and discussed by lawyers because that's more in the gray field that still needs interpretation of the law I will pause here to allow for other questions thank you Thanks, Flora. I, I would just thank you. Thank you. I would just say yeah, um, if you have any questions, if you have any questions, please leave those in the chat or the Q and A section. Uh, I've got two hands up from the panelists. Um, Alexander, you were first, uh, so in the spirit of, of, of in that, uh, please go ahead. Yes. Uh, thank you, Valeria. Thank you, Olga. Nice to see you again. Um, one 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 comment, maybe. Because when it comes to Ukraine, um, when we speak about human rights, it sounds very well done. You know, Western world, we speak a lot about human rights. Um, but when you come in any detailed country, uh, it may be, I want to say, a little bit more difficult. Uh, I don't know the answer, but I asked myself, for example, when we come to the IT sector in Ukraine. And I, in the IT sector, um, I don't know the statistics, but most likely my guess is that 95 to 98% of employees are not socially secured um, working. They're not employed. They are called what we call um, self-employed entrepreneurs, uh, and uh, they all five uh, pay 5% 5 flat rate tax on the turnover, um, and may, mostly all outsourcing companies, Ukrainian and international one, I don't want to name any, 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 mention any name, they're all working via this structure. Um, when you look at Germany, uh, in Germany you have six criteria, and if out of these six criteria, four adopt, um, this is thought illegal. You know, for example, if you have one working place, um, if you have uh, one client, um, uh, if you have, uh, how to say, uh, one person you report to, um, this is some of these criteria. And um, in Germany, we call that fake self-employment. Uh, so this will be, from my point, very interesting how this will be evaluated, because if you apply um, German rules to the Ukrainian system and actually for actually, yes, um, lowering the, the, the social insurance costs, because if you employ a person in, in Ukraine, you pay more than 42%. You pay 20% uh, uh, personal income tax, you pay 22% social insurance. Mm. And uh, but but this will be very interested how this is will be actually evaluated 
and um, I, I'm very curious how this will come uh, maybe to some the, the Federal Office for Economic Affairs and Export Control who will be in charge in Germany or, or um, a German court. But maybe Frank, you have an idea how this, the outcomes will be there. <laughs> it's uh, difficult to say. Uh, as we know, prognoses are very difficult, especially when they um, are, let's say, related to the future. Um, but let's say what I wanted to, to add, <clears throat> perhaps uh, let's say from, from, from the perspective here in Berlin uh, with regards to the political process, um, uh, to the question which has been raised uh, by Olga. Uh, at the moment, certainly, let's say a number of questions are uh, still unclear because we don't have the administrative regulations uh, of that law, which are certainly going to um, define the guiding principles for that uh, federal authority who should implement the legislation. Uh, and this is due uh, to, to the fact <clears throat> that the, uh, the German uh, government has three ministries uh, which are involved uh, in uh, this specific process, which is the Ministry of Economics, uh, the Ministry of Labor and the Ministry of Development Cooperation. Uh, and this, uh, these three, uh, let's say, ministries are let's say, uh, negotiating at the moment amongst themselves um, what is supposed to happen and certainly here also plays into the game that the government has changed in Germany and uh, there might be let's say different uh, perspectives uh, from the side at least of the new coalition partners uh, which uh, might also let's say uh, make the process a bit longer uh, than was supposed to, to be. The second point is let's say the European uh, question. Uh, as I said before, uh, in mid-February, we expect that a new uh, draft will be submitted to the Commissioner's College uh, of the European Union. Um, they have tried already before uh, to implement such a legislation on the EU level, which has not worked out because uh, there was a big controversy around it. Um, so it's not the first draft that they are discussing. And uh, we can't at the moment say uh, when it will uh, be published. We cannot say when it will be uh, implemented in the end. Um, uh, my expectation, if you would ask me, is um, that it that is not going to be uh, significantly stricter um, than, than the German one. Uh, but in any case, uh, that the European level was not too happy uh, that countries like Germany and others have uh, started to implement such a legislation before it could happen on the European level, but uh, they seem to have been impatient with regards to European development. Thank you very much, Frank. Um, we actually have a question in the chat for Valeria. Um, thank you to Maria Vasilechko. Um, the question is uh, from, and she's asking, am I right to understand that the GCSA, GSCA rather, will apply to Ukrainian companies only in case of export operations with German companies or shall it also be applied when Ukrainian company imports goods or services from a German company? Thank you very much, um, Simon. I, I alluded to this question uh, just before when I spoke that this might be one of the cases that needs to be clarified through the uh, administrative um, documents that will come to, to comment on the law. I mean, generally speaking, yes, it primarily applies to um, the supply chain, the way it's defined, it means uh, um, the, 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 the downstream supply chain that is supplying into the German market. But I can imagine cases where it's one of the points that is being discussed and unclear yet how it will uh, affect the upstream supply chain. So I don't want to uh, give a false uh, security by giving um, your assurance that this will not be applicable. Um, I think this is actually a question that needs to be watched going forward as the law becomes clarified both by the administration and, and lawyers. Thank you. Thank you very much. We also have a, a, an affirmative comment agreeing with you, uh, Alexander from Alicia Havlenska. So, so thank you very much for that. Um, I have a question which uh, I'd like to put to the whole panel, but Kirill, perhaps um, if I could get your answer first. I mean, how good are Ukrainian companies at assessing and mitigating non-technical risks uh, at this due diligence and the social non-financial reporting? I mean, how, how much of a learning curve is this going to be? I'd love to hear your perspective. Uh, 
difficult to say. Uh, question, I think that's one of the key questions. Uh, I have my family look at the participants. There are more than uh, 56 uh, out of about 100 registered. I see familiar names or I've seen uh, familiar uh, exceptions of email addresses. And I understand that uh, we are dealing now with the companies of very different types and sizes. Be it uh, what can be called as uh, business captains or small and medium or state-owned enterprises. Uh, and for each of them, the perspective will be very different. Uh, there are a couple of Ukrainian companies, uh, especially their branches for affiliates of transnational companies, uh, who, who uh, are well versed in very sophisticated uh, risk management and due diligence, uh, which is uh, which is that's in their genes, that's uh, that's in their uh, in chromosomes. Uh, for others, it will be a very new uh, area and it will require some work. Let's say if I was from a medium-sized company, if me, me personally, and I would know that uh, a year from now, uh, I will need to answer uh, my German uh, business partners uh, questionnaire on, uh, on uh, risk management on human rights environment. I would know that I need to do something right now. Uh, bearing in mind that it's not an easy process, it will uh, easily for a medium-sized company, it will maybe be a couple of hundred of uh, man hours. Uh, bearing in mind that uh, some documents will not be available uh, either in Russian or in English or, or in Ukrainian. Uh, also bearing in mind that uh, uh, the marketplace for specialists of this kind on, on non-financial reporting is uh, not yet too developed. And also bearing in mind um, inherent uh, resistance uh, from business owners or from managers, uh, it's an extra burden for them. Uh, while uh, convincing them that this is important uh, would not be an easy task. Uh, but then again, I would like to uh, reiterate that uh, Ukraine is not the only country, and the Ukrainian companies are not the only companies, or companies of any type, who are experiencing this, or who will be experiencing these difficulties, and professional advice, professional assistance is available. Thank you very much, Carol. Olga, I see you have your hand up, and um, we'd love to hear your perspective as well. Yeah, um, thank you so much. And, um, yeah, just a, a short comment on what uh, um, Kirill just uh, said about the um, how we can uh, bring the companies uh, uh, think about that uh, to, to act in the direction of the um, due diligence uh, or meeting due, due diligence requirements uh, um, in this act, for instance, particular this act. Um, as I said uh, um, in my um, statement earlier, um, it's really sort of combined work here and that's why it should be uh, thought maybe also from 2050 as a company perspective uh, if you're not yet in Ukraine I don't know if you have your clients here in Ukraine or not yet Simon or somebody uh, I'll pass it to one of the 2050 folk yeah Valeria perhaps if you want to take the question um well, in the five years after 2050, I'm, I'm not aware we've worked with a Ukrainian client, but but it might have been the case before. So I don't want to uh, I don't want to negate. Okay. <laughs> Okay, I see. Um, so um, the, here is a, at least twofold uh, um, activities uh, should be, uh, should be uh, taken, uh, taken, undertaken. Um, one at the business level, uh, that's uh, the consultancy work, advisory work, uh, uh, this uh, um, businesses, uh, um, uh, this work of the uh, um, uh, German Ukrainian AHAKA, uh, so uh, more actively include uh, or um, involve in this worker, um, Alexander Marcus and colleagues, for instance, for instance, also from the uh, European Business Association. But the other thing and the other um, important uh, um, factor here is to work this, uh, as I said, with Ukrainian governmental institutions who are responsible uh, for such kind of issues. It's, it's maybe not, uh, I mean, uh, it's definitely a, a child labor or slavery, etc. We have some, some very, very rare cases uh, of uh, such issues, uh, um, but uh, um, uh, we have, as, as Marcus, uh, as, as Alexander Marcus said before, yeah, we have uh, uh, many other. Um, 
gray zone issues here in Ukraine, which should be brought to the attention also of the governmental institutions. And um, my uh, personal opinion is that uh, we don't have at the, uh, um, the governmental level in Ukraine the properly uh, uh, functioning system of the uh, um, human rights uh, um, uh, ombudsman. Yeah, we have uh, some business ombudsman uh, who is responsible uh, for different kind of issues uh, and uh, um, defending the uh, uh, and lobbying business interests uh, um, at the presidential level. I don't know. Um, Cabinet of Ministers level, Homna Rada, etc. Um, but we don't have really um, uh, the institution. Uh, Ministry of Justice uh, in Ukraine is responsible for this issue. That's clear. Um, but again, I don't think that it's uh, uh, it, it work. It, it, this system is working now uh, properly. Um, so we should really think about the uh, having the uh, very uh, close dialogue with uh, Ukrainian governmental institutions who are in charge of the issues of the human rights, uh, uh, business development, and uh, um, again export uh, and. Uh, um, relations with European Union and not only, uh, so foreign affairs in this direction uh, to uh, create the, uh, um, or at least to, to, to work on uh, uh, creation of the uh, legislative uh, framework uh, for this uh, um, issue, for this, for this topic. Thank you so much, Olga. I'm conscious we have around 10 minutes left. Frank, you have your hand raised. I'll pass the floor to you. Yes, just, just a very short uh, let's say piece of information for Olga Trofimetsa. Um, we have been we have been together with our colleague Anton uh, Mitsubonichi, who is also online, and who is actually the initiator of this whole process uh, leading to the seminar. Uh, we have been in the um, embassy in in uh, Berlin, in the Ukrainian embassy, and also informed your colleagues uh, from the trade section about this legislation already in December. Uh, so we have already also been in contact uh, with with state institutions uh, of. Ukraine in order to uh, inform them. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, great. Thank it's a great. Thank you for this update. <laughs> thank you. Thank you both. Um, we have a question uh, for Valeria and Kirill. Please feel free to jump in on this as well. Um, where should companies sourcing in Ukraine look at in particular? Where should they start? Um, they're not expecting, uh, for example, slavery or child labor in Ukraine. So what should they expect? What should they focus on? What should they start with? Kirill, should I, should I go first? And you, and yes, yes, please. You back me up with your yes. lo local expertise. Thank you very much. So Julian, thanks for this question. It's a really good one, but um, um, it's also a really deep one. So I will just give you an overview of how I would go about thinking about it. Because as I said before, the human rights risk profile of a company will really depend on its size. It will depend on the sector in which it operates in and on the countries um, in which it's present. And that also means uh, on the um, where, where, for example, its employ employees come from. So, so there is no general answer to that. But I, um, I know we've uh, Olga mentioned that uh, the agricultural sector is quite an important one in Ukraine, and also industrials is 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 an important area. And so, for example, I can imagine that it, you would have to look at issues of adequate pay. Um, uh, adequate compensation, so um, um, adequate working hours, health and safety would be an issue to look at, um, but also freedom of association, freedom from discrimination, quite, quite a few things from that list that I showed in my presentation. I can see them being widely relevant for, uh, for businesses from different um, sectors and sizes. And then I would like to add, because several people have said, well, certainly we'll, we don't have to look at slavery in Ukraine. And I understand where you come from, but I would like to, to, to really raise my flag here and say that, yes, this will be an issue you will have to look at. That is, that is even an issue we're looking at in Germany, because uh, what the law means it, it, it means, it doesn't mean slavery like in the old days where people sit in chains on the boat or dig holes. It speaks about a modern form of slavery that is so widespread that all countries 
uh, have issues with that. We have really millions, if not billions of people working in conditions that qualify as modern slavery today. And these, um, uh, and these conditions are usually find in sectors that apply, that um, employ migrant workers that do hard and dangerous work in a seasonal manner. And I'm sure when you look at your agricultural sectors, you will find migrant workers from, from further east. You will find uh, maybe internal uh, migrants. You will find workers that, uh, that work on their uh, in the in the in the in the gray market, so to say, uh, unofficially, that may not be paid, even though they have done the work. Maybe that have to um, give away their passports or pay for very expensive accommodations. Maybe they had to take debt to get the job that is excessively high. And the, the sum of these factors can lead to conditions that will qualify as modern slavery. And it is indeed something that I would encourage you all to, to take with you, that this will be a topic that you will be asked about in the context of this law or any other law that deals with human rights, because it is one uh, an issue that really affects all countries, including the Western European countries. Thank you. Kirill, please compliment me. If yes. Anything. Yes, uh, I um, I'm, would add that I would advise three very easy steps for a CEO or a principal shareholder of, uh, of a typical uh, Ukrainian company to do in order to, uh, to get acquainted with the, with the whole material. First, read the Universal Declaration of Human Rights adopted by the United Nations in 1948 to understand what human, right, what human rights is about. Uh, it's an easy reading, four or five pages. Then I would uh, call uh, 2050 BIF in Berlin or in uh, uh, or check their site, uh, or be it in London, and read the brochure, uh, which they published, excellent, excellent brochure, uh, together with Accenture on best practices of human rights approach in uh, uh, big companies, EU and non-EU. Uh, also an easy reading, although in English. And third thing, uh, to get acquainted with the Ukrainian uh, state human rights policy, uh, to see where Ukraine uh, sees itself and uh, where it's heading. Uh, and one, another very brief comment, uh, uh, look around yourself uh, outside of your office, uh, think out of the box, for example, I was really astonished uh, by a case, reported case of discrimination in one of the IT companies when the HR uh, headhunters um, conducted a uh, search for, uh, for human resources, indicating that they will, be, they will have some difficulty speaking Ukrainian in their, in their, uh, their job. A clear discrimination uh, uh, of uh, those who prefer, uh, who are not so bilingual as uh, most of the Ukrainians. So these are four easy steps uh, that I would recommend. Thank you. I, I think that's a fantastic takeaway, Kirill. And just conscious of the time, um, if I could ask maybe Alexander, if you've got your hand up, if you can make your comment and, and whatever takeaway points that you have. Yes, I just wanted to ask. Um, I see two main points, um, or maybe three. Um, social secure employment, I already told about that. Um, ecological topics, um, because, uh, you know, uh, the Ukrainian situation will be either, it could be either that uh, no one is looking at it, um, um, and, and, and uh, your, your supplier in Ukraine may be not uh, working compliant to ecological rules. Um, and uh, the third one is trade unions. Yeah? Because trade unions, it's very different. In Ukraine, you need three employees and the three, those three employees, they create the trade union and they can make you major problems with your business. And they do not work like trade unions in our countries. You know? So that makes it very difficult. And um, I understand every employer who tries to avoid setting up a mini trade and union only in your company, where you have some people that are having interesting ideas, because it's not like in our countries, it's different. And that makes it difficult. Thank you, Alexander. Um, Frank, I'll turn to you uh, before I turn to Valeria for final comments. Um, 
Thank you very much. Uh, I don't know if I have much to add, but I think uh, it's an, an interesting uh, political process, uh, which uh, certainly has major implications uh, for uh, also a country like Ukraine, although uh, I would assume that when the discussion went on in, in the German um, political arena, nobody really thought about Ukraine. Uh, but uh, since this law is going to have a universal um, significance, um, the Ukrainian companies uh, who are, let's say, increasing even their uh, interaction with German ones and in the future with European ones uh, when this legislation comes uh, to the European level, uh, will certainly have to look into this. And um, I think uh, it's good that, that we have such a large number of participants here uh, who are interested uh, in, in that question. And uh, I'm looking forward to the cooperation. Thank you very much, Frank. I'm seeing we've got a couple of questions coming in now, um, which perhaps, um, Valeria, you can answer. They're, they're, they're sort of very late and complicated uh, separately or after the, the yes. webinar. Um, I'll, sure. I'll let you, you can see those. So choose to answer what you like, and I encourage you to give the final, your final comments. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, so, um, yes, given we only have one minute, I'll focus on my uh, final comments. I just want to say that I feel we are encouraged by the, the overwhelming interest in this, in this offer today. And I think it's really uh, timely um, for Ukrainian companies to, to get informed and to, to really figure out how to embark on this journey. And I can only share from our experience in other, um, yeah, in other yeah, more challenging markets across the world, working with companies there, that it is indeed possible and feasible, even in challenging environments, to uh, pursue a human rights uh, agenda. It does pay out. It creates a competitive advantage at, um, for sure, and particularly nowadays as these laws become more and more wide, widespread. And uh, I do encourage you to follow the offers of the German government and its uh, representative institutions, because there will be offers to support uh, local companies that are supplying the German market in their implementation as well. Thank you very much for your attention. Th thank you, Valeria. And just uh, by way of concluding, um, thank you so much all for your participation. Um, we've had a fantastic attendance today, a really engaged audience with wonderful questions. Valeria, thank you to you and, and to 2050 for being such a substantive, wonderful part of this discussion. To Frank, Kirill and Alexander uh, and the wonderful dignitaries who've given up their time. It's um, it's been a productive discussion. I've learned a lot of things uh, and uh, I'm very, very pleased we've done it. And I believe it's only the start of the conversation. So thank you all. Have a lovely rest of your Thursday uh, as we head into the weekend. And I'm sure there'll be lots of follow-up to deal with these very complicated issues. Thank you so much. <laughs>